is the challenge of post-colonial studies, decolonial studies, decolonial pedagogies, and decolonial approaches uh, in a modernist university. And as you can guess, uh, I was you know, thinking about this. So part of what I thought is that the challenge that was put before us today is to reflect on the following question. So how to distinguish between post-colonial studies and decolonial studies? How to distinguish between decolonial studies and uh, colonial, decolonial pedagogies? And whether and how decolonial approaches differ across disciplines? For us to understand post-colonial and decolonial studies, we ought to understand colonial studies. And for us to understand colonial studies, we ought to understand the colonial. And for us to understand the colonial, we ought to understand the human, both in the colonial and in the exterior to the colonial contexts. Unfortunately, the dominant pursuit of decolonial efforts, especially in academia, as we know it, is philosophically and theoretically rooted on Western scholarship, thus its practices are consequently tied to Western practices. This has deeper implications to the struggle to remove the colonial from our teaching and learning and the operations of the university, which is a modernist institution. In this lecture, I will speak as an African and a black scholar immersed in the struggle for local and global justice. And to do so, we will need to look at how the human is understood in our academic institutions as a modernist enterprise, the implications of such understanding on our perceptions and articulations of justice, citizenship, and global citizenship, and how an exterior to modernity understanding of human might inform our struggle to remove the colonial in our scholarship and practices amidst the unceasing pressure of modernity's inherent coloniality that oozes through our curriculum, texts, lectures, activism, and all sorts of engagements that make our day-to-day -day life. The Cartesian logic, which constitutes the heart of humanism, especially as manifested in Cartesianism, attests to the decision-making process in conceptualizing and understanding the essence of being human. In Cartesian terms, the mind discovered itself, defined itself, made sense of itself, and the life it leads. This in contrast to the body, which is rendered almost meaningless in regards to understanding existence. In Ubuntu, as opposed to humanist world, and Ubuntu is spelled U-B-U-N-T-U. As opposed to humanist world, existence is not reduced to thought, but to the perception of being that is contingent on and inseparable from fellow humans. Moreover, Ubuntu focuses on the whole being and manifests in the communal known in Swahili as Ujama, whereas humanism focuses on the creative power of the human brain and manifests in individual. While in Ubuntu, a community is not made of individuals because the perception of individual is absent in Ubuntu world, individuals comprise community in humanism. I argue for the absence of individual in Ubuntu using as a premise the motto itself and African spiritual cosmologies. When translated literally, the motto uh, means a person is a person unto, because, or with persons not others, thus rendering both the singular and the othering obsolete by not allowing the definition of personhood through self or individuality. African spiritual cosmologies, on the other hand, presupposed that at no point is the physical entity often known as the self in humanism alone given that our ancestors are always with us in real world and daily affairs. African and diasporic post-colonial literature wrestled with the issue of finding adequate expressions of humanity as a form of liberation from colonialism. However, 
Such attempts fell short of the stronghold of humanism, albeit constituting an indispensable foundation on which to build the quest for African epistemological independence and the grounds of equitable epistemological participation in global discourse about global philosophy of education and a philosophy of education leaning towards an Ubuntu understanding of humanity. Despite the noble role played by post-colonial thinkers such as Cesar, Singor, Fanon, Edward Said, and, and the wide range of current African scholars, all those influenced by those, who, uh, those scholars who engaged in liberation struggles and post-colonial uh, scholarship as well, the continuum was that in conceptualizing this, the essence of humanity, the entrapping power of epistemology inherent in humanism and its misappropriation as a global instrument to define humanity prevails. Even scholars with a very keen eye to catching the nuances of epistemological subjugation at times fall prey of such in their analysis. Essentially how we understand human has implications on how we relate with and treat the human, thus uh, having consequences on theories, policies, and practices directed to the human. Theories explain human phenomena from the corresponding lenses of the epistemological conceptualization of human. Policies, on the other hand, address issues of human condition, calling for social and global justice, and interrogating sociocultural power from the corresponding ontological and axiological principles. And practices birth, nurture, and promote educational and sociocultural services intended to serve the human as understood in its corresponding context. Consequently, we cannot speak of decolonization of pedagogy without taking at least most of these aspects into account. Now, I would like to invite us to imagine a box. Not exempt from having smaller boxes and perhaps even uh, other shapes. And the expansive diverse space that exists outside of the box. The box is modernity. The space in is the world exterior to modernity's direct total influence. Modernity is the period that roughly springs out of the Enlightenment period and establishes itself through humanism. Humanism is not to be confused with humane or humanitarian, as has been the case on many instances. In fact, this confusion has turned us into accomplices into the colonia. It is noteworthy that the box relies heavily on structures. While structures existed prior to modernity, such structures became more established through the philosophizing and theorizing of humanists and the legitimizing of what became known as the scientific method, a method that was and still is viewed in Western epistemology as the path for reaching truth in an incontestable manner. So through the scientific method and theories such as functionalism, it was possible to firm structural differentiation on scientific and theoretical grounds. Since then we have hardly question this beyond the boundaries of the disciplines that modernity created, thus unable to shake it off completely. And by disciplines, I mean academic disciplines. In other words, modernity has established itself so deeply that we are even afraid to consider, let alone fathom any alternative. And now that we have introduced the, the concept of the box and the exterior space, one might ask, what about the borders? Who dictates the width of the borders and who in the initiates and controls the action that takes place or is allowed at the borders? As we have learned in more clear terms <laughs> since the advent of colonialism with the Berlin Conference, a uh, random division of Africa, for example, into the era of borders as regimes, borders play a major role in determining who is allowed and who is not allowed into a space. Borders are transitional spaces between the space within the box and the exterior space, thus important in demarcating the box and the exterior space. We can know the demarcation of the box, but do not know the demarcations of the exterior space, except from the standpoint of what it is not and ought not to be 
using the box as a reference point. And Walter Nignoli yesterday talked about the reference point. As you might already have sensed, this critique begins from a central idea, the box as a point of reference and the exterior space as one that does not have a specific shape nor can serve as a reference point, at least until now. This is a syndrome that we Western formal educated academics have inherited from the box imposing on us a need for a frame of reference and then a priori claiming itself as that frame of reference. In other words, we are stripped of the prerogative to dictate the terms, to analyze and to explain our own reality, let alone fathom the possibility of dethroning the box as a frame of reference. The obligation to delimit this exterior space is a derivative of the box's imposition of the importance of territoriality, not because of, uh, based on respect for the autonomies of the space outside the box, but on defending the and expanding whenever feasible its space and confining the exterior space to its shape and essence. This is the box, that is the box imposes itself on the exterior space, absorbs portions of the exterior space and forces such portions to confine to its form and nature. The box was not designed to shrink, but to propagate the myth that anything happening to it is a catastrophe for the exterior space because in its core, the box believes that it has created that exterior space and has teleological control over it. The box is apocalyptic to anything but itself. It has elevated itself to a status of a god and wound up the clock to time the activities in the universe. Now you pause here and think about a whole range of development goals and other goals and the global agendas imposed on the exterior space to achieve within a specific time frame. I unapologetically argue here that modernity is a humanist establishment and colonialism was a project that derived seamlessly from its perception of the human. Without an understanding of human furnished by humanism, perhaps we would not be speaking of colonialism, but of Cosmo Ubuntu. Now, Cosmo Ubuntu presupposes the non-discriminatory and non-hierarchical understanding of human that derives from African cosmology. Ubuntu, which is described in the modern person as a person unto, through, because of, uh, of persons and with persons, um, Cosmo Ubuntu is the voluntary embracing of Ubuntu as a foundational value system in our participation in planetary conviviality and underlying voluntary. That is the embracing of Ubuntu as our perception of humanness on a worldview that informs our conviviality without forcing universality. In this value system, personhood applies to all humans and precludes individuation, classification, and hierarchies. In other words, humans and humans because of humans, thus rendered uh, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic class, and uh, status, ethnic and geographical or, or origin are incommensurate categories. These categories, which feel at home within the box, might be relevant to the entire exterior. Thus, the exterior faces the conundrum of not seeing walls. Yet, that exterior is confined to the outer space and realizes, and perhaps in shock, the existence of the box when interacting with the elements of the box, theories, policies, and practices as they manifest the individuated human of humanism and modernity. I'm gonna share an extract of a poem I wrote, which is Perceptual Walls, uh, to predict this conundrum. And so these percept perceptual walls between us, robbing me from the sight of you, these fences of wood, or barbed wire, visible or invisible, confining me to sight you, but not experience with you. These divides that nurture the, the visible over the indivisible. Perceptual walls that created and nurtured the other 
othering me from you, othering you from me, creating the them and us, the them in us. Perceptual fences in nature, creating the illusion of togetherness in the reality of otherness. Perceptual barbed wire fences eluding being yet fostering absence, pointed edges, perceptual in nature yet willing torture, isolationist divisionism, plundering human dignity, plundering Ubuntu. The poem problematizes the concept of walls as an imposed separatist, a separationist colonial instrument while also serving as a protector of the colonial by nurturing the divisible and the other. It was the humanist perception of the human that created, nurtured and imposed itself on the other. Thus, disregarding the cosmology that emanated from the world of its brainchild, the other, whose abode is the exterior space. Please note that I am not arguing that those societies in the space exterior to modernity were created by modernity, but instead that the concept of the other is a result of modernity's exclusivist perception of itself. No matter how humane the project of modernity portrayed itself, its foundation in a Cartesian perception of the human, the Kantian hierarchy of race, the, the, the Victorian Christianizing of the other, and the tenets of structural differentiation and cultural rationalization on which they all anchored, prohibited it from reaching any sense of global justice and participating in a global education project and that was based on equitable participation of all humans. What baffles me to this day is the naivety with which the world of the so-called educated, the world that assumes the status of being the educated without questioning its colonizing uh, of epistemologies exterior to modernity, continues to thrive on, in rumblings about educational projects that have no sense of justice yet are replete with rhetoric about justice. Walls are imperative for the box's existence and its self-perception and preservation because without walls, the box dissipates and becomes part of what the box perceives as a vast shapeless space waiting for it to give form and reform. Everything waits for the box to give form and meaning. Without the box, nothing has form or meaning. This arrogance of form and meaning is what gives the inhabitants of the box the sense of exceptionalism and consequence of priority. The following aspect of the poem captured this sense. I stand in my space and watch you over there. The there so close yet not so close, so rosy yet not so rosy. I stand in fertile ground while you on the other side of the fence stand in defense and in respect for your ancestors whom I refuse to claim as mine too. The fertility of my ground, this fertile land, this physical space I call my own is rooted in a reality that I choose to ignore. I categorically refuse to embrace the ancestral links that make us who we are, bound. Here, the exceptionalism and superiority manifested as a refusal to share human ancestry. The irony is that despite refusing common ancestry, the box has no problem <clears throat> with the claim that human life began in the exterior, which implies an outright shape, shameless acceptance of a rationalizing of this gross denial. However, since the box makes the rules of what is and what is not for the world with this is universalism, no rebuttal will be able to withstand its rationalization as long as the rebuttal applies the very rules that the box created in order to outsmart the box. This too baffled me for decades. So to think that one can use the weapons of conceptual life, uh, weapon, weapons concept, conceptualized and manufactured and perfected by the enemy in order to defeat the enemy. This is like living in a willful delusional state. That is, one is not delusional 
due to a psychosis, but delusional by choice due to ignorance or by sheer gullibility. The inhabitant of the box stands in comfort within the confines of the box and watches the struggle of those upon whom the box imposes its way. The fertility that the inhabitants boast uh, is uh, the habit of boast is a byproduct of the box's expansion through imposition and theft of parts of the exterior space. That, for, that fertility is also a product of the blood and sweat of those who have been forced out of the exterior to work the land in the box. The natural wealth extracted from the exterior and the toxic waste dumped in the exterior. The paradox is the choosing to ignore the reality on which this injustice is rooted while casting a rhetoric of pursuit of justice and democratization. And while creating theories, policies, and practices to recolonize the exterior through new forms of economic nationalism, for example, establishing new extractive economies, and through intensifying epistemic violence, according to Vasquez, and attempts to epistemic genocide, a term, genocide, a term that I use, I prefer. The term epistemic genocide, this term, I choose this term because it is intended to add the non-modernistic cosmology, which links intrinsically the epistemic to being. In other words, the noble idea captured by the epistemic, uh, the term epistemicide, Santos and others, is not enough to convey the link between the genos and the epistemic because the erasing of the epistemic is intrinsically linked to the erasing of a people. The acknowledgement of the roots of this injustice requires the acknowledgement of the historicity of a perpetuity of intention to practice both epistemic violence and epistemic, epistemic genocide. The following extract reflects this historicity. This fertile land of our ancestors be the land to those whom Francisco de Victoria called Hentis, my co-native siblings whose physical presence is rooted in this soil, plunder dignities, but never raised identities. Resilient spirits of our ancestors staying woke even in the silence of our physical voices, we the people shall stay woke. This land, fertile land of our ancestors be the to those whom Emmanuel Kant called uncivilized and teachable, Teachable for servant. So the historicity of the box's perception of its superiority and refusal to acknowledge and honor common ancestry has a bearing in the coloniality, uh, oppression, and the dominance established. The human subjected to these conditions is relegated to a dehumanization that can be rationalized through a humanist understanding of human and the modernistic tenets of differentiation, rationalization, and individuation. New theorizing must understand the nuances of this complex historicity marred by epistemic violence, attempts at epistemic genocide, and the consistent triumph of, and of resilience and survival. Resilience must inform new theorizing and must be complemented by a commitment to abandon the centrality of thinking as the means to realize the human, as in the case of Cartesian human, and a commitment to liberation and justice that are not defined by the box, but by the exterior and on the exterior's terms. For instance, a theoretical grounding of justice emanating from the exterior will be based on ontological and axiological premises of the exterior conceptualized in epistemologies of the exterior and articulated in languages of the exterior. The following excerpt of the poem demonstrates this outcry from the exterior. A categorization with a glass ceiling so low, as low as in a to-go bunt of a structure, landscaping, but not dreamscaping, not hardscaping, not soulscaping. Land escaping, but not dream escaping, not hard escaping, not soul escaping. Dividing minds from hearts, but not hearts from souls. Dividing bodies from spirit, but not spirit from land. Land and soulfulness, land and being, land and paideia of the soul. How can we learn not if land is bitter? How can we learn if land is sweet? 
lessons embedded in coloniality, hidden in modernity, concealed in negative homogenization, landed embedded in coloniality, hidden in cosmopolitanism, concealed in negative equality. We, the people, shall stay woke holding Bantabas with no rash resolve, but with an earnestness to soulfully engage, derage, but also delink, border think and also border engage, this center and also deep rise with no center, no peripheries. We no longer post-colonialized, post-slaverized, post-imperialized. We are no longer indigenous tribes, aliens, third world developing nations, poor people, refugees, and documented Walls, fences, divides, melting away as we evoke Sankofa to stay woke. The classification and categorizations emanating from humanism and modernity are very limiting, despite uh, promising no limits. Had this not been the case, uh, we would probably not be talking about inclusion today. Instead, we would be frowning at the box's idea and the colonial plan of inclusion. So this too baffled me for decades that we do not ask ourselves and the programs we create to include the other, a very fundamental question, inclusion to what? Inclusion is like landscaping for modernity as its agenda does not contradict the expansionary agenda of the box. Read this as the old assimilation policies in colonial times. These policies are now embraced as global projects uh, to assimilate those in the exterior or those from the exterior who have been brought into the box by direct or indirect force. Essentially, force is being exerted on all to get into the box. When hearts and souls are not nurtured, epistemic, ontological, and axiological territories are at stake. Resilient is manifest through some who attempt to escape the incorporation into such territories by holding on to heart and soul, their essence, holding on to their multifaceted cosmology entailing spirit, land, ancestry, soul, being. Theorizing must learn from the bitterness of land, the land that has been denied spirit systematically and land that witnesses its ancestry being insulted, violated, and dehumanized. New theorizing must reflect deeply on issues of power dynamics in negotiating epistemological territories, heightened sensitivities about coloniality and, de and, and colonializing efforts lingering in modernity, cosmopolitanism, and globalization, and democratization. Advanced agendas for education centered on perceptions of human aligned with the exterior and rid itself of conceptualizations and processes of legitimizing created in the box. New theorizing must therefore soulfully reckon with the coloniality and colonializing, and I use the word colonializing uh, purposefully, maybe nobody else does this, but because I want to keep the colonial fully there, uh, you know, and colonializing propensities appended in the pro progressive revolutionary theories emanating from areas close to the borders of the box. That is the critical theories that have paved the way to superficial yet valuable political liberations in some exterior spaces, but not conceptualized by the exterior, have failed to see the appended coloniality that followed them in their noble political sojourns in the exterior. We should stop labeling the exterior Marxist or post-structuralist simply because there might be a resemblance of such theoretical underpinnings in the way the exterior theorizes about its own reality. In our attempt to label sub, uh, subversive notions and practices through theoretical lenses, we often fail to see the originality of the action and its correspondingly theoretical originality. The coloniality of theory embedded in our minds leads us to assume that only Marxists, the Marxists and the Foucaults of this world can legitimate, legitimize subversion as a theoretical, at a theoretical level. Such attitudes also causes us to accept the misguided perception that what happens and must happen 
in the exterior can only be confined to action, not theory, as a consequence of the view that the exterior needs pragmatic solutions, not theoretical abstractions. What we indeed fail to see is the colonial nature of such confinement because, and despite the importance of pragmatism, theories have been some of the greatest instruments of colonization. As such, the urgency of pragmatism, its main accomplice. Hence, herein I caution us to stay woke and spot the theoretical colonialism, which is my term, includes the lingering colonial debris, also debris, my term, in critical theories, despite their liberatory intentions and accomplishments. So theoretical colonialism manifests through hidden coloniality, Mignolo, uh, Mignolo's term, that's uh, where I got it from, and concealment in negative homogenization, which I got from uh, uh, Andrea Sialumumba, and negative equality found in discourses of modernization, cosmopolitanism, globalization and equality. The exterior's depth of awareness presupposes an awareness that modernity's clock and its subsequent uh, imposition of pragmatism and urgency are colonial in nature and undermine the long history of colonialism imposed on the exterior space and its people. Such awareness must inform new theorizing and steer us away from reactionary rage by deraging in order to theorize at a moment of soberness when apathy and complacency tend to settle in. It also needs to inspire us towards cutting dependency from theories of the box by delinking and moving beyond border thinking towards border engaging. In addition, it should do away with the center periphery binary by doing away with the concepts and labelings of the center and periphery. So Mignolo and Lost and Nova incite us to reflect on the status quo and shift our theorizing to the borders. That thus, I urge that new theorizing from the exterior ought to pay close attention to what happens at the borders. A cosmopolitan orientation in new theorizing can offer to border thinkers and border engagers a thrust into a more proactive critical advocacy. We must ran, remember that working within the framework of modernity, citizens of the box have inflicted numerous atrocities on citizens of the exterior and unapologetically imposed themselves as export, experts in things like environmental and climatic matters, which they violated grossly due to relating citizens to the, ex relegating citizens to the exterior to a category below human, thus disregarding their lives worth. These behaviors were explained and justified within uh, frameworks generated and nurtured by modernity theorizing, uh, as these serve uh, the modernization agenda, consequently, as we think about the colonial, decolonial, post-colonial, neo-colonial and such, let us bear in mind that the box and the outer space are pertinent to our interrogating the question of citizen, citizenship, global and global citizenship, since these concepts convey and perpetuate a binary sense of inside or outside a person, center peripheral persons and stem out of a colonial reality of who is and who is not human. Citizens are humans who live within the confines of the rights reserved for humans. Non-citizens are lesser than humans who live outside the confines of the rights reserved for citizens. Consequently, if justice needs to occur, it is imperative for us to engage towards a debordering of the epistemological and ontological domains and decentering the peripherizing enactments of global citizenship. In this pursuit, we no longer take for granted the embedded colonial in such enactments, thus engaging in decolonializing. We ought to come to the following realization. Concepts and enactments do not exist in a vacuum. The colonial permeates both concepts and enactments. Concepts, enactments, and the colonial are rooted in theory. Concepts, enactments, the colonial and theory inform policies. And 
This realization has a bearing on the understanding and enactments of global citizenship, thus has implications for global justice and the way we learn, teach, write, talk about global justice. It is not worth it that as we move from the center of the box towards the borders, we witness a progressive outlook for justice and an intentional effort towards the solidarity with the exterior through advocacy for the marginal, the disenfranchised and the dis disadvantaged people. For decades, postmodern theorists have provoked more reflection on issues of global justice. Nonetheless, postmodernism did not overcome modernity, but unwittingly forced it to reinvent and redeem itself. Modernity is alive and well today and postmodernism exists at the margins of the box, not outside of it. Both modernity and postmodernity are built on rejection of what they deem outdated and inadequate. That is, neither of them has worked independent of their humanistic core, thus have continued to frame their arguments and worldviews on perceptions of human inherent in humanism. This is a conundrum for the agenda of global justice in enactments of global citizenship. Therefore, in order for us to advance a globally just perception of global citizenship, we need alternatives that do not build on modernity or postmodernity and, and are not confined to a humanistic perception of human. New theorizing must grapple with these past evils, theoretical colonialism and pragmatism and urgency as instruments of coloniality. New theorizing informed by Cosmo Ubuntu must refrain from modernization agendas of modernity and rely on processes as integral parts of problem solving. New theorizing must stop the colonial framework inherent in the one-sided advocacy and impact which presupposes that only the box impacts the exterior with what it deems to be good for the exterior. Allow me to reiterate that modernity has laid the foundation for structural differentiation that breeds social hierarchy, cultural socialization that justifies discriminatory practices and neocolonialism, and personal individuation that accelerates competition and exploitation of those perceived as the other and marginal or exterior to modernity. The world currently operating under the power of modernity is at a technological threshold and new theorizing needs to carefully consider the options for engagement in long lasting solutions that will not make us accomplices to a new form of colonialism and the historical iterations or iterations of the colonial because we simply joined in and played the game as defined by modernity's offspring. The modernistic educational systems we inherited continue to serve as vehicles for perpetuating modernity's domination in all social systems because their theorizing and perpetuation happen when, during schooling years globally. Our option then is to bring Cosmo Ubuntu to the current global stage and infuse our inherited wisdom that humans are not only connected to humans, but also to their ancestors, to land and the overall cosmos. New theorizing with a Cosmo Ubuntu orientation must be built on faith in an efforts towards the recovery of memory of the myriad of the exterior epistemological sources and variation. And thank you very much.